Good morning. It's good to be here with you all and um, with the Lord, most of all. Welcome to everyone here. Welcome to visitors. Welcome to uh, people watching on live stream. Let's begin with uh, prayer together. I'd like to do it maybe a little different than I usually do, but just where you're sitting here today, quietly, silently, I'd like you to ask the Lord, to talk to the Lord, and if there's a need that you have here today, if there's something you're asking for Him to give you, to speak to you, to teach you, let's take a moment of silence and all do that. Lord, you have heard the prayers of each one. I can't meet their need, Lord, but I know that you can. And we ask you to do that. Somehow, in some way, by your spirit. Like the song said, we know not how your spirit moves. But we thank you that your spirit does work and is working and will work here today in every heart that is hungry. So Lord, I pray, guide this message and my words. In the name of Jesus, amen. As I was preparing for this message this week, I was praying about what to talk about and was thinking this is Mother's Day, so didn't want to miss an opportunity to speak to the mothers. Um, but I didn't really feel like I got a Mother's Day message. So I kept praying and seeking God and felt like he did give me a message of something that's a burden on my heart. And, um, but as I worked through that message, it dawned on me that actually this is a, is a good Mother's Day message because mothers are actually the greatest example in the natural world of the thing that I want to speak to you about today. And so um, we'll unpack that as we go, but you mothers have the privilege of uh, displaying something of God and of Jesus that God's given you to do in a way that he's given, he hasn't given men to do. And so we thank God for that. Thank God for each one of you. And I pray that you can be encouraged today with your role as a, a woman and as a mother. You have something to teach all of us men and all of us Christians. I want to talk to you about the neglected key to the Christian life. There's one teaching that Jesus gave that is included in all four Gospels. Only one that I'm aware of. And we know that um, you know, God inspired, breathed his word through the people who wrote it. The things that are in the Bible were there. God picked them out. God put them there. And so he didn't make any mistakes. And uh, this one teaching of Jesus was the only one that's included in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So that, that says something to me. Um, you know, John's gospel was written... I believe they think it was written like 30 years after the other three. John most likely read those. And uh, of course his gospel is different as we know. He included some other aspects that he felt needed to be shared. He was Jesus' best friend. And um, he knew the love seemingly of Jesus in a way that maybe some of the others didn't know quite as well. He wrote about it for sure. Um, so, but 
he wanted to include this teaching that was already in those other three, even though he did not include every other teaching. So that's a powerful thing. Um, this teaching was shared seven different times. It was um, four different occasions that we, that we can tell by the text. So it wasn't just like Jesus shared it once and they all you know, said it again, but there was actually four different occasions. So it was obviously something that Jesus taught on a somewhat regular basis. Now, everything in the Bible is important, amen? If something's taught once in the Gospels, is it, is it important? Jesus taught one time that you must be born again in the four Gospels. That's very important, isn't it? He taught what we're gonna look at here today seven times. He taught uh, to love your enemies two times in the Gospels. Now, of course, there's more times in the epistles and everything for these, but in the Gospels, to love your enemies, he taught it two times uh, that's recorded. The Beatitudes are recorded two times. Um, the teaching to give and it shall be given unto you is taught one time. But, you know, in some circles that's taught a lot. Give and it will be given unto you. Give to my ministry and God will bless you. Um, Jesus taught that one time. By the way, he also taught three times that it's harder for a rich man to enter heaven than for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. Those folks don't usually um, mention that one. So we want to major on the things that, that uh, Jesus majored on. Are you curious? What is he talking about? Turn with me to John chapter 12. This is the occasion where Jesus taught this. That was uh, right at the end of his life, coming, getting ready to go to the cross. Right before the Last Supper, and here in John 12, verse 23, Jesus answered them saying, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. And here's that teaching. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. Seven times Jesus said that. And five of those seven times, or maybe it's even six, um, it's connected with the teaching of taking up our cross and following me, Jesus. In our day today, we don't hear much about that. Why is that? We hear all kinds of things, and I'm thinking of the Western Christianity, I'm thinking of American Christianity, maybe even ourselves here. I think we neglect this, and I think it's a key that unlocks a lot of things that we may not realize. Jesus said, he who loves his life loses it. He who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. We could look at it, let's turn to uh, Luke chapter 9. Luke 9, 24.
And in the Gospel of Luke, he teaches us three different times right there, three different occasions. But here in Luke 9, 23 says, and he was saying to them all, and this was right after Peter, you know, he, he, first of all, he made the great profession of faith, and then he said, Lord, you know, far be it that you should go and be killed. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Um, but in verse 23, and he was saying to them all, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake, he is the one who will save it. For what is it profited if he gains the whole world? What is a man profited and if he gains the whole world and loses or forfeits himself? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory, in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. But I say to you truthfully, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God. So here Jesus said we have to take it up how often? Daily. Daily. Is that, a, is that something that's a real thing in, in your thinking? I'm taking up a cross today. It should be. I have to confess that it hasn't always been in my life, but I want it to be. And uh, as I prepare for this sermon and other messages, you know, I, I'm the one who's maybe feel the neediest of all. So I, I appreciate the opportunity to um, have God speak to me. So, you know, what does it mean to take up your cross? Be humble? Be humble? That's a good answer. I had a friend who carried a wo big wooden cross to parades and stuff. And I'd go with him and we'd hand out tracts and, and uh, he would witness, you know, for the Lord. He had, you know, I guess it's not here anymore. It's about as big as the one we used to have here. Um, I think that's good, but that's not what Jesus meant, is it? What does it mean to take up our cross daily? Um, let's go ahead and t take up the screen, James. I'd like to talk to you the difference today, talk to you about the difference between the man-centered gospel and the God-centered gospel. There's a whole lot of man-centered gospel, and it's what it sounds like. Man is at the center of it. Um, it's about man, it's about God. God's out here blessing the man. He's giving him health, he's giving him wealth, and he's promoting his self. It's helping them to run faster, jump higher, win medals, you know. There's a view of God that, he, that, that man is in the center and God is kind of our, our helper, our, yeah, oh, he's our savior, you know, and our, all those good things. But there's very much, man is at the center of it all. Um, that's not the gospel that's in the Bible. The Bible's gospel is a God-centered gospel. It's, it's a gospel where God is at the center. And man is centered around, is, uh, has him as their center. It's where God's glory is what's the highest goal. It's where God's purposes are what we're here for. And it's where, it's a gospel that leads to repentance from self-centered living. You know, the, the, the root of all sin is self, isn't it? The self-life. So when Jesus said, if you're going to be my follower, you cannot be my follower unless you hate what? Sin. Yourself. You say self has got to go. Self is a problem. Self is my problem. And so, in, in essence, real repentance is a turning from self and selfish living 
to where God is the center of everything. Amen? That's what the real Christian life is. That's what it's supposed to be. But so much of the gospel that's, that's out there today is telling us, maybe in subtle ways, not just so blatantly, but that, you know, it's about you. And God wants to bless you, and God wants to make you great. And God wants to, uh, God exists to meet all your needs. And that you have a right to everything being nice in your life. You have a right to be healed of every sickness. You have a right to have all the money that you need. You have a right to have, um, to be significant and to be, uh, to have your dreams come true. Do we have that right? I don't believe we do. Fact is, we don't really have any rights. <laughs> we don't want what we deserve. Do we? I don't want what I deserve. I want mercy. I want grace. And so... Uh, it's not about our rights. It's about God's glory. It's about him being in the center. Jesus is the example. You know, he was fully God, but fully man. And what did he say? John 8, uh, 29, he says, I do always the things that are pleasing to my Father. In other words, I do not give in to self for one minute. He says in John 6, 38, I did not come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So every moment of Jesus' life, he, his purpose was to do the will of God. That's what he said, I do always the things that please him. Isn't that what we're called to do as well? To, we, we could ask ourselves that question, is this what God wants me to do? Or is this what self wants me to do? And if we know the difference between the two, we know what we should choose, right? Amen. Sometimes it's a little confusing. You know, I, I'd like this, and I'm not sure, you know, maybe. But uh, a lot of times it's pretty clear. So that's the thing that I've been challenged with. Um, Jesus was the example of that. You know, in, uh, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This chapter is very familiar. We all love the, love the especially verse 17 where it says, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Beautiful verse. But in verse 15, well, let's go back to 14. It says, for the love of Christ controls us. Having concluded this, that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all, so that they who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who died and rose again on their behalf. You see it there again? Our purpose, he died for all so that we who live would no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died for us. This is where I saw the Mother's Day thing come in. I had to think about it, you know? My wife's had 11 children that survived. Is it 12 or 13 pregnancies? Or 15, okay. So um, it was easier for me to forget that. But you know, the very biology and physiology of creation. In order for there to be any one of us here today, somebody had to give up their self. They had to offer their self to be a vessel for another self to find life. You see that? And I think any of you mothers who are here can testify it's not all pleasant. There's a lot of discomfort. Amen? 
It's not easy. I'm thankful that I'm not a woman. For that reason and many others, but not because I th think less of women, it's just I'm grateful for who God made me. But I'm really grateful that God made women too. And I want to honor you today. You gave up your personal freedom. You gave up your good feelings. Throwing up. Feeling lousy. You gave them up. You sacrificed your own self. Why? Because you wanted to be a vessel to bring life into the world. That's a beautiful thing. And only women can do that. You suffered loss for the good of another. You lost some sleep. You gained some weight. You know, Jesus suffered loss that others might have life. It's a picture of Jesus, isn't it? Jesus went through excruciating pain that we might be born of God. And so, all of you mothers have gone through excruciating pain that those children around you, or if they're not right around you now, wherever they are, that they might have life. That is a amazing gift that every mother has given to their children. And they should be honored today for that. Not just taken for granted. Oh, that's what women do. You know, that's the way they are made. Well, that may be true, but there's plenty of women today who aren't embracing that. Right? Saying, oh, I don't want discomfort. I don't want to lose my figure. I don't want to be hindered in some way. You know, I was thinking about uh, uh, the sin of abortion, that in a sense it's an antichrist thing. I guess all sin is, but abortion in, in that respect of, you know, it's saying, I am going to not live for another. I'm going to take their life because they would infringe upon me. Whereas Jesus said, I'm going to give my life for others. Now, if you, have, if you have committed that sin, I want to tell you here today, you can be forgiven. Praise God. Don't be condemned. But I find it's, it's good to call things what they are. And maybe even the worst thing you can call it. And then say, now, Lord, please cleanse me in your blood. First Corinthians 10 says, let no man seek his own, but every man another's wealth. And of course, lo uh, love chapter of First Corinthians 13, it says, love does not seek her own. Let's look at um, Philippians chapter two. This is the, the chapter that talks about Jesus' humbling himself and to the ultimate. Verse one, therefore if there is any encouragement in Christ, if there's any consolation of love, if there's any fellowship of the spirit, if any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, united in spirit and intent on one purpose. Verse three, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, regard one another as more important than yourselves. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, he did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped or held onto or claimed or, you know, But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. 
Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, and the the whole context of that is this salvation, this walking with the Lord of taking my cross, emptying myself, and taking up the cross to be like Jesus, like he did. And, and he promises us that they that do that will be honored. You know, Jesus has the place of highest honor uh, and directly connected to, for this reason it says, because he humbled himself even to the death of the cross, that God highly exalted him and every knee will bow before him. And so our calling as Christians is to embrace that cross every day in all the different ways it comes. So what does it mean to take up our cross daily? I want to look at that a little bit. Well, I think we could start with the verse we already alluded to of Jesus. uh, And he also said it in the Garden of Gethsemane. He said, not my will, but thine be done. That would be a good way to start every day. Say, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. I have some plans, I have some dreams, I have some hope, I have some thoughts. But Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Um, Jesus used the word to hate his own life. And he, what part of life is he talking about there? He's not talking about our physical bodies, right? He's talking about our self-life. To hate. And that word hate, as I understand it, it means it's, it's more of accurately maybe described to say to love less. To love your life less than you love God's will. How about, so so there's things that we need to put to death in our life every day, is what I've been seeing here. All those things of self. What about all the ways that your self is offended or hurt? Aren't those things that need to go to the cross? When I said the title here, the key, the missing key, or I forget how I said it, the uh, neglected key of the Christian life, so many people hang on to the hurts. I heard a saying years ago, and this fellow said, don't nurse when you're hurt. He said, don't nurse your hurts. Don't you know, nurse them, oh, it's, you know, I feel so bad for you, I've really suffered so much. And don't rehearse them over and over and over. They did it, they did it, they did it. But rather, disperse them through forgiveness, and then re- you will reverse them. And they will become things that are actually a blessing in your life. I had an incredible testimony I heard recently of a fellow that went through something I hope none of us would ever go through. He was held at gunpoint and his wife was sexually abused. When I heard him tell this to me, I started weeping because it just was so 
just felt so bad for him. But he said to me, he said, don't, he said, you know, it's okay. He said, don't cry. Don't, don't. He said, it's all right. It's all good. He said, I needed that to come to the end of myself. He said, God, the devil meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And they went through some hard things. I mean, I'm talking marriage problems. I don't even want to say everything it was, but basically almost leaving the faith to the point of despair. And in that place, someone said to them, I can't help you, but I know Jesus can. And if you'll cry out to him, he will meet you. And so this man and his wife began to do that. I thought maybe he just did it one time. He said, oh no, he said, we did it. We did it time after time after time. We kept crying out to God. We kept asking for deliverance. We kept confessing everything we could you know, of our sin. We, we sought God with all of our heart. And somewhere in the midst of that, Jesus came through with an incredible deliverance. He said, I've been filled with the Holy Spirit. My old self has been taken out of my life. Don't, don't weep for me. Rejoice. Just like Joseph said, you know, guys, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. I think that's a healthy thing that we can all consider. Satan means all the bad things that happen to us for evil. Everything that wicked done to us, every offense, every wrong. Satan means it for evil. But when we can come to that place like Joseph did, like this brother that I'm telling you about did, to where we say, oh God used it for good in my life. He actually used it for something good. Wow. Talk about turning, turning it around. Jesus was the most unjustly abused person who ever lived. Amen? I mean, he was totally misunderstood. He was called a bastard, you know, and born in sin. And that wasn't the fact. But he couldn't defend himself and say, hey, well, wait a minute, you know, you don't understand. You know, it was the Holy Spirit that came upon my mother, you know, and, and no. That would have just made things even worse, probably. They couldn't understand. He was murdered for the sin of blasphemy, misrepresenting God. Now talk about the worst <laughs> mistake or the most uh, unjust. No, Jesus knows what it's like to suffer without having done a thing wrong. He's our forerunner, he's our example. And I, I feel like this is a neglected part of our ministry, I think. I think we should be encouraging each other more in embracing the cross. I realize when people have been wounded and hurt and, and all that, they need a lot of compassion. They need a lot of tenderness and care and love and all of those things. But the words of Jesus are the words of life. And the way of life is to, for that self-life, that wounded self-life, that hurt self-life, that to be denied. Can you deny yourself the pleasure of rehearsing the hurt that's been done to you? That's a denial, isn't it? It's a self-denial. Just like denying yourself the pleasure of looking at some 
pornographic images or something. That's also denying self. Saying no. No self. We're not going there. God's help. So this, this matter, I really feel in, in so much, uh, I wonder how much less counseling we would need if we would all truly embrace the cross daily. I feel like there'd be a lot less. There's an answer here that is sorely neglected. And, I mean, Jesus said it to us seven times. Every single gospel, at least four different occasions, and when he was here on earth, he, he taught it. I mean, he's the master healer. He's the master savior. He gave us the key that we need. Don't be fooled by the popular gospel that's all over. And, and one easy way to identify a false gospel is if they never mention taking up the cross and denying self. If whenever you listen to a certain preacher, you know, obviously you don't say it necessarily every sermon you give, but if those things are never mentioned, you can be pretty sure that this gospel is, if not false, it's very imbalanced and off, off base, for sure. Um, so that's just a little thing for you to consider. There's people today that are popular as can be. They have 30,000 people coming to their church every Sunday, and they never would mention the cross. What they mention is, you know, you can have your best life now. You can be healthy, wealthy, self-actualized. <coughs> you can have it all now. And people love to hear it. The carnal man loves to hear that. But we Christians, we love to hear this other message. You can be free from that old self-centered living. You don't have to have that ball and chain around you anymore. Because Jesus hung you on the cross with him when he died. And you can embrace that as your reality today. That's what it says there in Romans chapter 6. That's, that's the news that thrills my soul. That old self, that old rotten Paul, no good, deceiving. And on down the line, I could name it all. I don't have to let him run my life anymore because Jesus has provided the way for me that I can have that guy on the cross with Jesus and I can have Jesus inside of my heart. So let's just take a look at the uh, practical outworking of this that Paul writes about. We'll, we'll look at it in Ephesians and in Colossians. So turn with me to Ephesians. I think we'll start in verse 17. We're going to read quite a few verses, so try to hang in there and stay engaged. I'd like you to look for, while I'm reading, where you can see this cross. I believe this is the, um, he's basically describing what Jesus said we're supposed to do when he said, take up your cross daily and follow me. So, starting in, breaking in, Ephesians 4, 17. So this I say and affirm together with the Lord that you walk no longer just as the Gentiles also walk in the futility of their mind, being darkened in their understanding and excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. And they, having become callous, have given themselves over to sensuality for the practice of every kind of impurity with greediness. But you did not learn Christ in this way, if indeed you have heard him and have been taught in him, just as truth is in Jesus, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside the old self, which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of deceit, and that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. You have a new attitude. And you put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. 
And then he fleshes it out a little bit. He says, therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak truth to each one of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And do not give the devil an opportunity. When we are living within the self, that is Satan's opportunity to have his way in our life. Don't give him an opportunity. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with one who has need. Let no unwholesome word proceed from your mouth, but only such a word is as good for edification according to the need of the moment, so that it will give grace to those who hear. So again, denying myself. No, I'm not gonna steal that. I'm going to work today. Oh, I'm not gonna say that nasty thing right now. No, that would feel good, but I'm not gonna say that because I want to build up people around me. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind one to another, tender-hearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. There it is again, forgiving one another. I was listening to a message of Zach Poonin the other day, talking about um, denying ourself. And he said, he was speaking to his congregation, he was kind of reproving, reproving some of them, <clears throat> that they got offended, get offended if someone doesn't shake their hand on Sunday morning, or you know, if he didn't smile at them that day or something. And uh, he basically said, you know, he said, you all, you're in kindergarten. If you're still all caught up in these offenses of self, these petty little, you know, oh, they looked at me the wrong way. They didn't acknowledge me properly. You know, they didn't this, that, and the other. He said, you're in kindergarten. And then he shared his testimony of being supremely maligned for being a false teacher, for being uh, just all that he went through as a young believer. He was, you know, he was a go-getter, and he had some things, I'm sure, that needed some correction, and, but he really went through a lot of people putting him in his place, and he embraced that. He's, he embraced that as an opportunity to die to self. And he gave, the, he gave the example of, you know, people who are businessmen, you know, they don't like to miss an opportunity to make money. You know, hey, this is a great opportunity. Oh, I missed it. I wasn't, I wasn't fast enough. I wasn't on top of it. And uh, raised the question, well, when we deny self, isn't that an opportunity to gain something of eternal value? We should be like that businessman that says, oh, I missed the opportunity, I could have gained something. <clears throat> Next time I'm gonna get it. I'm not missing that one again. I'm gonna get it next time, I want, some, I want that gain. I don't know if this is true or not, but he, he felt that the people who will be closest to Jesus in eternity will be those who Embrace the cross and life, uh, his life here on earth. I can't give you a verse for that. That sounds reasonable and right. But at any rate, that's a challenge to us of, you know, are we missing opportunities that God is putting in our lap for these things that are done to us, these hurts, these wounds, these um, opportunities that we could deny ourselves? All right, let's turn to Colossians then. We're getting ready to close here. Colossians chapter three. And uh, if you're familiar with Colossians, you know that in, in and Ephesians, in both of those books in the beginning, uh, several chapters, Paul, basically doesn't demand anything of anybody or tell them what they should do, but he just says, look, you guys are blessed in Jesus Christ with all heavenly blessings, you know, you are adopted into the family, 
etc. Just really just lifts up all the beautiful things that we have in Christ. And then he turns later on in the books to the practical application. So that's where we are here uh, in Colossians 3. Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things that are on earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you also will be revealed with him in glory. Therefore, consider the members of your earthly body as dead to immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and greed or covetousness, which amounts to idolatry. For it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them, but now you also put them all aside. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and abusive speech from your mouth. Do not lie to one another since you laid aside the old self with its evil practices and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. A renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave and free man, but Christ is all and in all. Verse 12, so as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, to the which indeed you are called in one body, and be thankful. Again, I think this is a description of this command of Jesus to take up our cross daily and to follow him. It's to put to death that stuff, to put it aside. Those overwhelming emotions that may rise up to us of old ways of thinking and patterns. If it's part of the old flesh and self, that means I can, I can get rid of it with the grace of God. It's not just something I have to put up with. So I believe, um, This is the remedy for, I wrote, I wrote here that this is the remedy for marriage troubles. I mean, can we not boil marriage problems down to two wills of self that are clashing with one another? And uh, as one marriage counselor that I t uh, spoke with one time uh, shared with me, he said, you know, basically when we get, get together with people, he said, there's just, there's one place we're headed. We're not gonna get there the first time or the second, you know, it may take a while to get there, but he said, the one place we're headed is for them to forgive each other. And usually you have to work through the, some of the stuff and you know, people aren't ready to do that, but that's why they're in the counselor's office, you know. If you have two self-wills that want opposite things, you have what's called war. If you have one of them die to themselves, you can have peace. If they both die to themselves, you can have fellowship and oneness. Hallelujah, that's what we want. That's beautiful. But that's what it takes. And the most spiritual one is probably the one who first dies. It's okay, I'll be the doormat. They may have to be that for a while. Doesn't mean you necessarily neglect your responsibilities. But not pushing your own agenda your own way. So I just wanted to put that out here. I believe there's a, a lot of answers to marriage problems, interpersonal relationship problems. 
if all of us would embrace that cross and say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. I give up my rights. I give up my position. We can have oneness, fellowship. I thank God that my wife and I have fellowship. We have oneness of spirit. That is a heavenly thing. So I'm going to wrap it up here. The neglected key to the Christian life was the title. I do feel like it's been neglected. I'll say that in my own life. We've seen how this is a teaching Jesus taught a lot. And yet, much of what we have around us in America, on the internet, is promoting another message. A lot of it's promoting self. It's a man-centered gospel. But the real gospel has God at the center and all of us gratefully, praisingly surrounding his will, having repented of, of our own way, having turned from being our own boss. I just commend that to us all here today. May God help each one of us to apply it to our life. Whatever we're going through, whatever our situation is. Why don't we just bow our heads here and pray together? Talk to the Lord. Jesus, we love you. We love your example. We love how you went to the cross for us when we were not worthy, when we were sinful and ungodly and even against you you. Lord, you're our, our example. Lord, I pray that you'd help me and each one of us today to embrace your cross in a fresh way in some area of our life. I pray that you'd open our eyes, Lord, to see the glory on the other side of the cross and to recognize that it's not death that you're after, but it's life but death is needed first. Take your word, Lord, and apply it. We love you, and we want to do your will, not our own. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yep. Yeah. This first symbol reminds me of religion. He was a good person. That's why he's in hell. That's right. Maybe we should all get a sign like that and stick it in our bedroom. Little reminder. <laughs>